Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be invited to launch my new book on this occasion at Gresham College and to be among friends in doing so. I have valued my association with the college over the years since I was first appointed a Gresham professor, thanks to the kind initiative of the then clerk to the Mercer's Company, Michael, now Sir Michael Wakeford, whom I'm delighted to see here this evening. It's equally a great personal pleasure and an honour to be introduced this evening by my old friend, David Vermont, who was master of the Mercer's Company when I was first appointed and was also then chairman of the Gresham College Council. He became my patron as a new Gresham professor, and in fact, he chaired my inaugural lecture then, some 20 years ago. That lecture was on the ethical conduct of business. This evening's lecture is on evolution and its impact on Christianity. The connection between the two lectures is not just David Vermont, it's that I am at heart a theologian devoted to exploring the inner structure of reality in its various manifestations. So, my new book and this evening's talk are aimed at exploring the new interior structure of Christian faith, which I think should follow from our new evolutionary understanding of life. Now to my lecture. When Georgetown University Press was considering the publication of my new book, Christianity and Evolution and Exploration, it obtained positive judgments on it from three experts in the field, which I considered a great honour, and I may add something of a relief, since my book was by way of being a pioneering study. To one of those scholars who commended the book, I was doubly grateful because he found a phrase which I thought captured beautifully my aim in writing the book when he wrote that it represents a new stage in the encounter of theology with evolutionary thinking. Before this, almost all of the modern Christian writing about evolution has been concerned with what I call post-evolutionary apologetics, with the work of such Christians as McGrath, Polkinghorne and Ward aimed at rebutting attacks on Christianity from, I will not say evolution, but from some militant evolutionists. The aim of such apologetics is to defend the existence of God, the providence of God, and the unique status of God's human creatures in an evolutionary context. By contrast, the purpose of my book is to move well beyond this defensive approach to Christianity and to explore positively the impact which accepting evolution has on Christian beliefs and doctrines as a whole. Hence my pleasure that one of the publisher's reviewers recognised that my book represents a new stage in the encounter of theology with evolutionary thinking. In such an encounter of theology with evolution, I suggest that the major Christian doctrine which seems most likely to be affected is the incarnation. The traditional belief that God became a member of the human species. Since a major question which arises within the context of evolution concerns the divine purpose of the incarnation and the evolutionary role and significance of Jesus Christ. To explore this, probably the most productive place to start in evolution is one major concern which is experienced within evolution itself by many modern sociobiologists. How to account for the presence of altruism within the human species. The term altruism, or concern for others, was introduced by the 19th century sociologist Auguste Comte, to contrast with the idea of egoism or self-centeredness. And one of the leading modern sociobiologists, E.O. Wilson, judged that, and I quote, the central theoretical problem of sociobiology is how can altruism, which by definition reduces personal fitness, possibly evolve by natural selection? Or, as he expanded it, <clears throat> 
How can one explain in evolutionary terms the surrender of personal genetic fitness for the enhancement of genetic fitness in others? Other sociobiologists, however, maintain that genuine altruism or generosity with no self-interest involved is part of ordinary human experience at its best and cannot be ignored for purely ideological reasons. As Stephen Pope concluded, and I quote, a great deal of human experience seems to make sense only if human nature has evolved in such a way as to include not only egoistic inclinations, but also capacities for genuine altruism and related affective capacities like empathy, sympathy, and compassion. Building on this, I have developed a Christian theology of altruism, explaining that for Christians, the prime source of all generosity is to be found in God, where it begins with the mutual altruism of the persons in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, towards each other. It is in the image of this divine mutual altruism that the human species is created, and such all-encompassing divine generosity is held out to humans to imitate in all their behavior. In this, they are invited to follow the example of Jesus, who, in the words of Paul, is the image of God, and the one to whose image his fellow humans are predestined to be conformed. Jesus became a member of the human species to exemplify, in human terms, God's own altruism towards us, and to teach us to imitate it in behaving altruistically towards God and one another. Jesus is teaching on what altruism or neighbor love involves and his personal example of accepting even death to show his own love for his father and his fellow humans can thus be seen as a major evolutionary step in the moral advancement of humanity and an indication that universal altruism is the evolutionary invitation and destiny of the human species. This altruistic leadership given by Jesus to his fellow humans, however, is by no means the only or even the main purpose of the incarnation viewed in an evolutionary framework. It has been a serious weakness of some even Christian thinkers to regard Jesus as merely an outstanding moral exemplar to be imitated by others, like Socrates or Gandhi. Whereas the primary evolutionary achievement of Jesus, I argue, was vastly more than that. It was something which he uniquely brought about, entering the human species and confronting death, which is the universal evolutionary experience of all living things. In overcoming his own death and rising from the dead, Jesus performed an act of cosmic significance. He won through to a new phase of human existence into which he could then usher his fellow humans in which they were destined to share fully in the inner richness of God's own life. From an evolutionary point of view then, the primary purpose of the incarnation the entry of God into the human species was to enable Jesus, through his own death and his resurrection to a new life, to save his fellow humans from individual extinction and in association with him to share in the divine Trinitarian life, which has always been God's loving evolutionary purpose for his human creatures. Such an evolutionary scenario, however, raises several major question marks rising from a number of Christianity's traditional beliefs and doctrines. Especially, in the first place, questions arise relating to the doctrines of original sin and of the fall of humanity from divine friendship and of humanity's continuing moral vulnerability, which we know as fallen nature and the doctrine of human concupiscence. Moreover, consequent on the questioning raised by the doctrines of original sin and the fall of our first parents and all their descendants, issues also logically arise 
about the belief that God became human precisely so that Jesus could atone for humanity's disobedience by sacrificing himself in atonement to his father, thus making up for Adam's defiance and restoring the earlier friendship between humanity and God. As one examines this interconnected cluster of traditional Christian doctrines, one central element which emerges clearly is the universal message of the New Testament that Jesus died to save us from our sins, which is not at all the same as the evolutionary proposal I have outlined that Jesus died to save us not from sin, but from death. Yet there is an intriguing connection between original sin, as it figures in the Bible, and the human experience of death. It is not too strong to say that the Christian Bible, especially the Old Testament, is preoccupied with sin and all its consequences, including its regular recourse to sin sacrifices. And it appears that all this stems from an early Israelite attempt to explain the occurrence of human death. Why should the human intelligent beings created by a loving God die? As they obviously and inevitably did. The simple answer proposed in Israelite culture and explored in the Hebrew Bible and in turn inherited by Christianity is that death came about through humanity's own fault because the earliest humans sinned in disobeying God. As Genesis puts it starkly in its account of creation, God forbade Adam and Eve to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and threatened them that, and I quote, in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Much later, the Book of Wisdom was to point out that God, and I quote, made us in the image of his own eternity. But through the devil's envy seducing Eve, death entered into the world. Death is thus viewed throughout the Bible as the divinely imposed penalty for a human sin of disobedience, summed up by Paul in his observation that death is the wages of sin. With the development, however, of a theory of evolution, the death of all living things, not just humans, is recognized as part of the process of ongoing creation through the survival of the fittest. Consequently, there is no further need to conjecture another explanation for human death, as we find in the traditional doctrine of its being a punishment for an original sin committed by our proto-parents. Scholars commenting on the story of the alleged fall of humanity in Genesis describe it as etiological, which is a common feature of the Hebrew Bible, aiming to explain or give the cause, or in the Greek, aitia, of various Israelite phenomena and features. J.A. Fitzmar is not alone in referring to the third chapter of Genesis involving the human creation and fall from grace as an etiological story. That is, one made up to explain the origin of various features of creation including the advent of death. In addition to there being no further need to postulate these traditional beliefs in original sin and the fall of human nature, as well as the belief in the death of Jesus as an atoning sacrifice to restore the friendship between God and his fallen human creatures, it is also widely recognized, moreover, that over the centuries, serious inherent difficulties have been experienced concerning those beliefs themselves. I have explored this in detail in my book, but it must suffice in this lecture to offer just two important instances. The first concerns a phrase in Paul's letter to the Romans, which was fatally misunderstood by St. Augustine of Hippo and became the foundation of Western Christianity's whole theological construction of original sin and the fall of human nature. Writing to the Christians in Rome, Paul was at pains to establish in Romans 5.12 that, quote, sin came into the world through one man and death came through sin, 
And so death came to all because all have sinned. Now that phrase, because all have sinned, is the new RSV translation of Paul's Greek phrase, epho, which literally means since when, or as a result of which all have sinned. However, the old Latin translation of the New Testament, which Augustine and his contemporaries used, and he had little Greek, translated Paul's words F-O as in quo, or in whom, leading Augustine to understand that everyone born after Adam had sinned in Adam. From this, Augustine developed his theory of the corporate solidarity of all subsequent men and women in Adam, their first parent, thus involving all human beings, indeed involving human nature as a whole, in Adam's own fall from grace. Hence the melancholy conclusion which Western Christianity has held for centuries, that since Adam, all subsequent human beings start life as a miserable lot of sinners. What Augustine called a massa damnata, a condemned lump, for whom only an atoning sacrifice on the part of Jesus would secure God's forgiveness. As the renowned patristic scholar J.N.D. Kelly concluded, the old Latin version of the New Testament, which had influenced only in the West, gave, and I quote, an exegesis of Romans 5.12, which, although mistaken, and based on a false reading, was to become the pivot of the doctrine of original sin. Augustine himself, under severe pressure from his Pelagian critics, found himself denying vehemently that he had invented original sin. He was protesting too much. Edward Arnold expressed the views of many scholars when he observed of Augustine in his book, The Theology of Original Sin, that, and I quote, the traditional Catholic expression of original sin is to a large extent that saint's thought. The conclusion must be that there is no evidence in the Bible to justify what became after Augustine the traditional Christian doctrine of original sin and of humankind's sharing a fallen human nature which requires sacrificial atonement on the part of Jesus, as Augustine and others found themselves led to explain. This conclusion makes all the more attractive the alternative evolutionary theology I have sketched of the incarnation and of the evolutionary achievement of Jesus. The second major instance I want to mention of the serious difficulties and questioning arising from the traditional network of Christian beliefs, starting with original sin and ending in the atoning sacrifice of Jesus, relates to the theology of satisfaction, which was developed to explain how Jesus became man to restore the friendship between God and his fellow creatures, human creatures, and his fallen human creatures. Early patristic attempts to explain how the reversal of humanity's alleged sinful state was achieved had included bizarre theories involving God's paying a ransom of Christ's blood to the devil to win back the human race which had fallen under Satan's power, as I explain in my book. A more intellectually respectable theory was proposed in the 11th century by Anselm, Archbishop of Canterbury, who has removed the devil from the scene and concentrated on a legal argument based on justice. Anselm maintained that there was a need to make restitution to God for the massive dishonor and injustice which had been committed against him by the first humans in disobeying his divine command. Only God himself could bring about such a momentous atonement, it was maintained, and this he did by crossing the dividing line between God and humanity and becoming a man precisely in order to offer himself in sacrifice to propitiate his father for humanity's early sin. This Anselmian theory of satisfaction 
to a dishonored God has held sway for centuries in theology, figuring in the Catholic 16th century Council of Trent and surviving to the 1994 Catholic Catechism and its explanation in paragraph 615 that, I quote, Jesus atoned for our faults and made satisfaction for our sins to the Father. Yet there is something disturbing, even disquieting, in the idea of Jesus literally offering himself as a sacrifice and a sin offering to God on Calvary. And somehow or other, in that way, restoring God's dignity and honor, thus making up for the insult offered to God by Adam and all of the human race which existed in him. Of course, once one dispenses with the belief in original sin and fallen human nature as biblically unwarranted, there is no further need to devise a way of remedying it. Even without that, however, no consideration was ever given to the startling counter-suggestion of Peter Lamp Abelard of what I find the most breathtaking question in the whole of theology. Why did God not just forgive Adam? And quite apart from all the unpalatable features of the primitive idea of propitiatory sacrifice, the satisfaction theory of redemption to undo the fall seemed to smack too easily of the salving of hurt pride. And with its emphasis on justice, leaves no room for mercy on the part of God, except once the divine honor has been satisfied. Considering these and the other problems arising from the network of traditional Christian beliefs, ranging from the fall through to the atonement, it is something of a theological relief to be released from having to subscribe to such doctrines and to accept the evolutionary proposals that I have earlier described. In his famous contribution to modern theology, The Need for Demythologization, Rudolf Bultmann highlighted the need to move away today from the outdated mythology which was developed in a pre-scientific age to proclaim the word of God. As I mentioned earlier, ancient Israel was deeply concerned about the phenomenon of human death and extinction and how to account for it alongside, alongside a belief in a provident creator. It contrived to do this by mythologizing death, turning it from a physical puzzle, which they were at a loss to account for, into a religious myth as the punishment for sin. And this was carried over into Christianity. Today, however, we are in a better scientific position to account for the phenomenon of death, seeing it as an essential stage in biological development and a step in the process of natural selection among all living entities, not just humans. We can therefore demythologize death and dispense with the need to postulate a divinely inflicted punishment for an initial act of human disobedience. As a consequence, we can also dismantle the massive theological structure which has resulted from the mythologizing of death, including original sin or pre-fallen innocent human existence, the nature of the original sin and the consequent permanent fallen state of human nature into which all humans are thought to be born as the result. And finally, the succession of theological attempts to devise to explain how the mythological sinful predicament of fallen humanity was to be remedied by an incarnate God. The consequence, the consequence of accepting evolution can also be identified on other traditional Christian beliefs, including the doctrines relating to the church, the sacraments, and Christian morality. Beginning with the church, the evolutionary achievement of Jesus as incarnate God, as I have explained, was to confront and defeat death and so usher the human species into a new phase of existence, surviving death with him. 
John Macquarie expressed this well in commenting on the theology of Friedrich Schleiermacher when he explained that, and I quote, Christ himself is to be understood not just as the individual Jesus of Nazareth, but already as the beginning of a new community into which individuals are constantly incorporated. End of quotation. In other words, the achievement of Jesus in breaking through death to a new phase of life is shared by him with all those who strive to live according to his message of universal altruism and are thereby accepted into his evolutionary fellowship. This community of humans in the process of being saved from death by Jesus is what we understand as the church. That is, the human species raised to a new level of existence and moral activity as an eschatological community of humans already existing now, but to be fulfilled in the afterlife. Moving to consider the impact of evolution on the Christian sacraments, and beginning with the Eucharist, I have already argued on evolutionary grounds against the need for a sacrifice to atone for the alleged fall of humanity. In addition, a detailed study of the four New Testament accounts of the Last Supper as the origin of the sacrament of the Eucharist does not bear out the view that it took the form of a propitiatory sacrifice as the Council of Trent maintained against the Reformers. And analysis of the documents of Trent itself throws, in my view, doubt on the force of its own argument in defense of the sacrificial aspect of the Mass. However, the sacramental nature of the Eucharist finds a central evolutionary role as an inspiring community ritual in celebrating the continuing presence of the risen Christ, saving his fellows from mortality, and regularly contributing to their increasing communion with a loving God. The sacrament of baptism remains within an evolutionary context the rite of initiation into God's people, and the water symbolism retains the idea of life and the power of the Spirit. But the idea of being washed clean of the stain of original sin loses its relevance. The sacrament of penance for Catholics remains highly relevant as the recognition of personal sinfulness and the need to be reconciled to God and the community in the event of having committed a serious breach with God or one's fellows through ignoring the calls of altruism and giving way to the self-interest which is central to the whole process of evolution. The only other sacrament which appears to require re-evaluation as a result of accepting evolution is that of sacred orders or priesthood. In the light of dispensing with the idea of sacrifice, priesthood can develop, as intimated by the Second Vatican Council, more in terms of Eucharistic and pastoral leadership within the evolutionary community. In addition, once the idea is accepted of the celebrant of the Eucharist ceasing to act, quote, in the person of Christ, in offering sacrifice to God, this also removes whatever theological ground there was for restricting ordination to men and excluding women from the priesthood. And this raises a final thought concerning the sacraments, that the possible ecumenical implications of evolutionary modifications of Catholic sacramental doctrine should be acknowledged, and that Christians can now be further motivated to transcend historical differences in accepting a fresh stimulus from evolutionary study. Accepting evolution also appears to have significant consequences for Christian morality. For one thing, given the continuing and indeed renewed concern in various quarters to maintain the natural law tradition as a source for identifying moral obligations, now that we understand human nature in an evolutionary perspective, differing moral conclusions may be expected to emerge from the natural law. The animal herd instinct, for example, which existed among our pre-human forebears, can be seen to have blossomed 
into a human community with all its social, political and artistic sophistication, including the, the moral criterion of the human common good and all that follows from that. Again, so far as concerns human sexuality, we can conjecture that this began in our animal forebears as the instinctive drive to reproduction, which became adapted in their case to the need to provide an extended caring environment for offspring which required considerable time to develop. With the progress to hominization or to becoming fully human, this sustained mutual support of parents for each other which initially helped them bring up their children together, came to be appreciated as human values in their own right, and expanded beyond the physical process of reproduction and upbringing to become a medium of interpersonal communication and sharing within a wide variety of personal and social contexts. Human sexuality was no longer simply animal sexuality. It had evolved into human sexual companionship, which could contribute to the personal and social enhancement of the individual persons involved. Thus, with evolution, this relationship between fully fledged persons is now capable of being exercised in numerous ways in society. This occurs most evidently in still sharing the capacity for the loving reproduction and upbringing of children but now it is also capable of finding expression in a range of personal and social contexts through other forms of relationship between the sexes which express and are influenced by their mutual interest and attraction. As I survey the ways in which I propose that evolution has affected traditional Christian beliefs, I have little doubt that at least some of what I have argued for could alarm or distress a number of Christian believers and elicit strong objections. Perhaps in what I have written and said, the two proposals most susceptible to such a strong possible reaction concern, first, my abolition of original sin and fallen human nature. And secondly, doing away with the propitiatory sacrifice offered by Jesus on Calvary to redeem a fallen humanity. In response to the first objection, I cannot stress sufficiently that I do not consider that I am doing away with sin or going soft on sin. With evolution, however, we do not now need the biblical tale of how sin originated with Adam nor do we need the Augustinian doctrine that it resulted in fallen nature, that is, a permanent disposition to sin on the part of all of Adam's descendants. It is sufficient to recognize that as limited, evolving, and often competing human beings, members of the human species are all prone to self-concern and even self-absorption to the disregard of expense or expense of their fellows, and have been so from the start, not just since some primordial moral disaster. Stephen Pope put the point well when he observed that, and I quote, evolution undercuts any assumption that we ought to strive to return to an original moral order. There is no reason to think that there was ever a time when we were not conflictual manipulative, selfish, and prone to deceit and violence, as well as cooperative, generous, empathetic, and altruistic. Indeed, evolution provides us with a deeper and more satisfying understanding of what sin is, rather than disobedience to the command of God, as Genesis depicted it. Now sin emerges, as Daly expressed it, as, in essence, a refusal to love, it is an unwillingness to accept God's plan for human development and living. It is a preference for self and one's own interests over those of one's fellows. It is a refusal to accept the image of God's own altruism, which is sown in our human nature at creation. 
and which continually prompts us to share our personal and social resources generally, generously with others. So far as concerns objection to my dispensing with viewing the death of Jesus on Calvary as a propitiatory sacrifice offered to God to redeem humanity, I hope it is clear that I still maintain that in God's evolutionary providence, Jesus died on Calvary out of love to save humanity. His purpose was not to save us from original sin, however, and placate God for which there was no need, but to save humanity from individual death and meaninglessness by conquering death and in his resurrection, leading his fellow humans to a new phase of evolutionary existence with a loving God. In this, as in many other ways, I suggest, recognizing evolution and exploring its impact on Christian belief can be not a weakness and impoverishment of doctrine, but an actual enriching of it. Belief in an evolutionary creation by God can provide a deeper appreciation of the mutual altruism of the trinity of divine persons as continually at work undergirding the infinity of detail involved in evolution and directing it to its evolutionary destiny of humanity sharing fully in God's own life. The challenging of death by Jesus and sharing his victory with the rest of human creation can only serve to strengthen belief in the divinity as well as the humanity of Jesus. In freely choosing to submit to the hostility of his fellows, intent on killing him, rather than reneging on his mission to bring his people to a true worship of a loving God, he was not reconciling an estranged humanity to an offended and displeased God. He was providing an inspiring instance and symbol of divine human altruism, conducting the evolving human species through death to the prospect of an ever closer communion with the divine life. An invitation through Jesus for men and women to imitate God's own altruism in all their behavior provides not just one aspect of the good's moral life, it constitutes the whole of human morality. In conclusion, what I have tried to explore in my book and briefly summarize in this lecture is the impact of evolution on traditional Christian beliefs. In other words, construct a theology of evolution. In so doing, I am offering a sustained example of the way in which I have come over the years to work out what theology does, or what is the purpose of theology. Many of us will be acquainted with the definition of theology which Anselm of Canterbury offered when he wrote that theology consists of, and I quote, faith seeking understanding, fides querens intellectum. That is, a religious belief urges us to increase our intellectual grasp of who God is and of what God is doing. Important as this definition is, it risks turning theology into a sort of sheer intellectual exercise and of abstracting it from the reality of life. What I have come to appreciate over the years is that our religious belief needs to be linked not only with our thinking, but even more with our actual experience. So much so that I think of theology as exploring the connection between our religious beliefs and our experiences. Does what Christians believe throw light on the human experience and enrich it by putting it in a context of faith? Likewise, does Christians' experience, whether daily or over the years, contribute anything to their faith, confirming it or deepening it? Or does their experience lead them to doubt or to deny what they believe or are invited to believe? In other words, as I explain in several of my writings, including this latest, theology involves a dialectic between faith and experience. It consists of trying to make experience sense of faith and faith sense of experience. This latest book of mine is an attempt to construct a Christian theology of evolution, 
by bringing together the experience of evolutionary science and Christian belief and seeking to develop a constructive relationship between the two, both finding a place in evolution for Christian faith and also exploring the impact of evolution on Christian beliefs. I hope people will find it interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, hugely enlightening, hugely stimulating, and I'm sure everyone in this room and all those who read your book will be most grateful to you for it. May I offer a, a, a comment? The demythologizing of Adam as one person and the particularity which is associated with that of the original act of sin, the act of disobedience, is a terrible stumbling block in the context of evolution. The great theological mystery is what happened when our primitive forebears who were not human beings became human beings. We don't know that, but what we do know is that it is part of God's creation and that in evolution we see that God created a world which creates itself and that we are part of that creative process. And I think that what you're helping many of us to understand is how evolution can put these things into a context, and I wonder whether you would agree with what I just said. Yes, thank you very much indeed. I think the whole question of what we know as polygenism, that is the descent of humans from their forebears in various instances, and not just in one instance through Adam, uh, the acceptance of that was a terrific stumbling block to the acceptance of evolution, particularly for Roman Catholics. Because Pius, Pope Pius XII condemned polygenism and said that Catholics were bound to accept, and this was when he was writing, right, uh, the descendant of all human beings from a single protoparent. Now, as I try to explore in my book, that has created all sorts of attempts to get round it. Someone like Karl Rahner, for example, made a very loyal but rather feeble attempt by saying, well, Adam is a collective name. <laughs> so it applied to a group of people. And so he was more loyal than scientific in that, I think. But now, what through evolution we're being uh, taught increasingly and daily in the press through the various discoveries being made and Neanderthal developments and so on like that, it seems to be that in history there was a whole series of breakthroughs from our predecessors into various intermediate stages and then into the full, what uh, Tyre de Chardin calls hominization, the fullness of a man. Now, it's, it's so difficult to grasp that, but at least uh, accepting evolution must make us realize that this, this must have impact and that the whole idea of polygenism must be now standards belief in the approach to evolution. But does that answer your question? It seems to me that the strongest indication that there never was a fall and that we aren't walking around today with a fallen human nature is that if there had been a fall, doesn't it seem strange that the state into which we fell is exactly that which we would have had had we been simply the product of Darwinian evolution? Thank you. We can say that now that we are familiar with Darwinian evolution. But before that, how could you explain death? How could you explain experience, sinful experience? I mean, Cardinal Newman, of all people, said that the belief in original sin was as certain to him as the existence of himself and of God. Now, how one explains that can only be in terms of you act on the lights available, you, available to you in a given generation. And now, well, uh, if one says, well, now, is the world better or less now that we've got rid of original sin? There's no answer to that question. It's a bit like the scientists who said, well, why do we think that the sun goes around the world rather than the world goes around the sun? And someone said, well, because that's what it looks like. And so she said, well, what would it look like if the, sun went, if the world went around the sun? Exactly the same. 
So I think what you're bringing out, in fact, is the limitation of our knowledge at any time and its contribution to our belief, uh, and particularly as regards the development of sin, which I've been suggesting is as old as creation. It wasn't simply a later role. A, a very shrewd Jesuit friend of mine who is no longer with us said to me once, and he, he ended the conversation, he said, the incarnation is too big to be a rescue job. And one or two writers in America have said, you can't go around saying that the incarnation is God's plan B. <laughs> and I suggest in my book that there's something mildly ridiculous, if not blasphemous, in suggesting that God's first attempt was a failure. And so he said, right, we'll have another go, but this time I'll be Adam. Right? <laughs> I don't know if that meets your question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you hinted that you new approach would have ecumenical possibilities. Mm -hmm. Would you like to enlarge on that? And again, would you like to enlarge on whether there are liturgical possibilities in what, you're, in what you've given? Thank you. Two very important questions. Um, I think uh, the, the, sort of the instances I gave about the ecumenical promise were both interesting and limited to priesthood or to the Catholic uh, sacrament of uh, holy orders. Um, and one of the big obstacles to ecumenism between the Anglican Communion and the Roman Catholic Church, of course, has been the ordination of women, and now the, the uh, impending ordination of women as bishops. Right? Now, the argument uh, against the ordination of women from the Roman Catholic point of view takes various forms, and we can't go into the whole thing, but my argument would be that theologically, it is no longer cogent to say that the priest acts in persona Christi, in the person of Christ, because the implication of that is he is acting in Christ in sacrifice, in offering himself. Now, if we have uh, uh, moved away from the idea of sacrifice, then we've removed that theological stumbling block, put it that way, to the idea of the ordination of other than men. On the liturgical side, well, from a Roman Catholic point of view, we've got enough problems at the moment um, with the new liturgy and so on. And even the Bishop of London, as I understand it, uh, has told his clergy that they were not to imitate the new Roman Catholic ritual uh, in the liturgy. But are there ecumenical... In yes, there have to be. But be, it'd be enormously difficult to untangle Precisely because, well, I suppose for two reasons. One, because our liturgy is always going on about what miserable sinners we are. Right? One. And secondly, because in the Roman Catholic line, and in the Catholic line in general, there's a great deal of, of emphasis on the idea of sacrifice. So to try and construct a liturgy in, in which sin and sacrifice do not figure prominently, is quite a challenge. You might care to take it up. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think, and probably other people did too, I found your talk and probably your book uh, profoundly refreshing. I must say that, because I've uh, had a sort of um, hmm, dichotomized existence beforehand, a Christian on the one hand, but an evolutionist on the other, and it means I've had to sort of try and ignore the genesis and things like that. So it's been very difficult for me, and my wife doesn't quite agree with me, and it, it's somewhat difficult. Um, anyhow, I, I, I haven't obviously thought things through in the way that you have. What would be the implication of your line of argument uh, for, oh, ideas like the second coming and um, the idea of apocalypse and uh, a final battle between good and evil? Or are we just going to go on with creation? You see what I'm mm -hmm. getting at? Yes, thank you for that. Uh, I think I should begin by saying, I'm not saying that evolution changes everything. <laughs> so there are whole areas of Christian belief which I think will remain unaffected. And that could include the idea of uh, the second coming, uh, of the ultimate fulfillment of everything in God's evolution and design, whatever that may be. You know, I think we would still be at a loss with St. Paul in Corinthians 15, 
in working out what the next life is going to be like. You know? uh, I think the main thing that comes through is, to me anyway, in this, the, what should we say, the, the tremendous consolation of the association between Jesus, the risen Jesus, and those who share his beliefs. And I don't necessarily mean his religious beliefs, I mean his moral beliefs, in other words, the importance of neighbor love. So, um, and that would be not a very satisfactory answer. I think I might say, well, it, it really, maybe we could pass on that one. <laughs> I was just wondering um, if the Vatican had um, actually um, Discuss this with you, and what their response and their reaction has been. The answer, the answer is watch this space. No, 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 no. My answer to that is not yet. <laughs>